Steele, and thanks for joining us. And 12 books to read in 2023. My guest is Archie Poulos, and I think of all my friends, Archie is the best read. He's a lecturer at Sydney's Moore Theological College. Uh, he lectures in ministry there. He's just finishing his PhD on how we can collaborate better in Christian ministry. And uh, he's brought in a pile of books to talk about. Um, uh, as I look at those titles, Archie, I think I've read two of Well, you've got the Bible there as well. So I think I've read three of them. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it looks like I've come in with my friends and, yeah. and it looks intimidating, doesn't it? Does it does look intimidating. Yeah. One, one of the things I want to say, though, Dominic, is that we're talking to pastors who are at the coalface and just surviving is hard work. And you look at these and you get really worried and you think, I can't keep up with this. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to do today is just help us to work out of the thousands of books that we could read, what are the sorts of ones that we should be reading? And so mm -hmm. these are just examples. Can I say before I do any more that I work at the college and part of my responsibility is to be reading books mm. so that others don't have to read every book that comes yep. out. And so while I actually don't like reading that much, uh, it's my responsibility to help our churches and I don't expect everybody to do it. Mm. So the first one, explore by the book. Tell yeah, us about yeah, that. Well, yeah. Come, yeah, I'll, I'll come to that. Actually, I want to start with the Bible. Oh, okay, but, start with the Bible, yeah. <laughs> uh, but before we do that too, they're, they're thick books. They are thick and, books. Uh, yeah. I want to say that we get all sorts of information from different ways, you know, podcasts, uh, short articles and that sort of stuff. But I do want to say every year it's good to read some sort of long form work because it actually makes you work hard mm. and we're losing that skill as leaders of God's people. I remember Dick Lucas used to speak about preaching. He said he hated preachers that were like water beetles that would just go over the surface and mm -hmm. never go down deep. And so having one or two books that you work hard on in a year is an important thing to do. But anyway, you asked me to start. Uh, I think there are three types of books. And so I've brought these in as mm -hmm. examples, not to say these are the ones you must read. Yep. And the first ones are about God, mm -hmm. because as John Calvin said, uh, true knowledge comes from knowing yourself and knowing God. So you've got to start with God. And it's really easy to forget this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's uh, the word of God. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you need to be living those spiritual disciplines of hearing God speak to you in, in an unadulterated form in his word. How do you do it? How do, how do um, your Bible reading oh, play? I, I get bored really easily. Mm -hmm. So I have to keep changing. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I follow uh, structures and uh, and so there's there's you know how to read the Bible in a year, how to read the Bible over three years, those sorts of mm -hmm. ones. Um, I'm Murray McShane. I, mm -hmm. I tend to go back to as my default. Other times, like at the moment, I had to preach on uh, on Matthew eight uh, earlier in the year, mm -hmm. and I just realised I am not as excited anymore about the wonderful things that the Lord Jesus did. Mm -hmm. And so over this month, I've been reading, I've read Matthew, Mark and Luke and just savouring what Jesus did, putting myself back there in the first time these things happened and thinking, wow, what's going on here? And so, that, so, I, so I get bored. I'll, I'll read through the Gospels and I'll go back probably to McShane again. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I do, though, is and I've been using this has been really helpful. It's explore by the book. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a few of these around. So Tim Keller is the author. Lee Gatiss has done mm -hmm. some of them. Uh, other names that you'll know well. Calvin uh, Luther. Yeah, Calvin Luther. Well, this is this is one which is uh, historical. I like it because if you just if you if you open it up, you can see mm. there's a short, probably one minute reflection from mm. you know, Calvin and Luther, Bullinger, people like that. In this case, uh, on passages. Tower of Babel. Yeah, different, different passages. Yeah. yeah. And then there's a short section of the scriptures to read. Then you take your own notes. Right. And. Yep. Um, and so uh, I'm doing it online. I'm not writing it in the book so I can reuse the book. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, that's what I found really helpful. So each book is 90 days, so it's a quarter. And it just keeps me honest. Mm -hmm. and, cool. Uh, and, so, and, and the other things too are on the scriptures. There's others that reflect on the scriptures. I've just, this is fairly recently out. I don't know if you've read it. No. Now this is Philip Jensen's new book, mm. The Coming of the Holy Spirit, Why Jesus Sent His Spirit into the World. And um, you were just telling me as you arrived that I mean, you and I have sat under Philip's ministry for a long time mm. as a mentor in our lives. And uh, and when I heard he had a book coming out on the Holy Spirit, I thought, well, I've been to two week long conferences on the Holy Spirit where he was the main preacher. And um, uh, there's so many other books to read. Maybe I'll just miss this one. Yeah. But you said oh, no, you this think is... there's some I... even for someone like me. Who's yes. Engaged yeah, with... and, and me, too. I think that uh, this is 
a really mature and thoughtful and wide uh, book on the Holy Spirit. And so it's what the whole scriptures say about the work of the Spirit, uh, which is often not what happens. People tend to go to the passages mm -hmm. on the Holy Spirit. It's uh, the unfolding work of God uh, on the Spirit. And the other thing too is, as I, read, as I read it, I just rejoiced in what God has done for us in the gift of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so it lifts your spirits as well. And um, it's in two halves. The second half is what we probably know Philip best for, which is on the specific issues that are associated with the Spirit. Mm. The first half is that which is just, what does the Bible say about how the Spirit works? And one of the things that I loved is the way that Philip doesn't just toe the party line. This is what we've always believed. He works hard on the Bible and it comes out in it. It mm -hmm. is a great piece of writing. What surprise, I mean, you having listened to him speak on the Spirit mm -hmm. for many, many years, what jumped out at you? I think it is the way that rather than contending against error, it's, a, it's what it does is show us what God is doing in his world and how his gift of his Holy Spirit to us fits in with that. Mm -hmm. And so, so it lifts your spirits. And likewise, uh, this other one, uh, which <laughs> Man, is... This is, this this is, is where we, <laughs> we've gone from a, a 500 piece hardback thing to the moon is always round. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's got lots <laughs> of pictures in it. It's, it's, it's a children's book. Yep. Um, it's by Johnny Gibson, who's yep. a graduate of Moore College, but he's a professor in Old Testament now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it comes from a, the very sad experience of his own life of losing his daughter and his young son saying, what's going on? How can God be good here? And the moon is always so he's round. dealing with suffering. It's a, it's a, it's about for suffering. children. Well, it, it helped me. Mm -hmm. um, I dealing with suffering. There's a few good books around. One of the things I used to go back to is an old hymn by William Cooper, who suffered terribly from mm. depression. And he said, in, in one, one of one of his verses in it. Um, Behind a frowning providence, God hides a smiling face. You know, the world might look mm -hmm. like it's tumultuous, but God has good purposes in it. And that's what this book captures as well. The moon is always round. As you look at the moon, when it's a new moon, you hardly see it. Then it becomes a crescent moon and a half moon, then a full moon. It's always a full, it's always a full moon. It's always round, but sometimes we only see parts of it. And so I think Johnny's image is great for kids, but it's really good for us all. And again, it's a way of helping us to engage with the scriptures. So that's the do first you, group of uh, books. Do you know, a decade ago, when I was um, being sued, I, I went on stress leave for a month. And um, my first day of stress leave, I had lunch with Simon Manchester. And um, for those outside Sydney, Simon's a great preacher here in our city. And um, he gave me a present of a CD where he had burnt um, 25 biographies of Christian leaders by John Piper. Oh, yeah. And um, on my stress leave, and I was really feeling down in the dumps, I, um, I listened to one of these biographies every day for 25 mm -hmm. days. And uh, what I discovered was A, Piper had really walked through depression, B, where he was really interested in Christian biography was the suffering yes. of the greats in the past. And I got to Cowper and he zeroed in on that verse. Mm. And, um, and that was for me the first time I, no, that, that verse from that hymn that you just quoted behind the, the frown of Providence stands a smiling face. Mm. And I'd never noticed or heard or picked up on that verse before. And um, I mean, at one level, it just says what Romans 8, mm. 28 says, but it says it with, he says it with such poetry yeah. and power yeah. and it's a very significant day. For yes, me, I mean, the, the, in case you want to follow, follow him, it's uh, God moves in a mysterious mm. way, his wonders to perform. Mm. It's worth reading. He, he was terrible depressive. He, there's a, the story, I don't know if it's true, but he, he actually went to throw himself off London Bridge mm -hmm. and, uh, and, by, and there were thick fog came through and he lost his way and he knocked on a door and it was John Newton's. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, things like that. that you have, have to go and listen to Piper's yeah, biography yeah, and find the, out the if that story's true. So you see the frowning <laughs> providence and the smiling face. Yeah. yeah. Next one. Uh, well, that's the first group, which is understanding God. There's another group of books that I think we need to engage in as pastors, and that is an understanding of our world. Do you know, I've tried to read a book on the cross every year. Mm. Do you know, um, mm. Although you didn't, you didn't have a book on the cross. No, no, but it's in that category. It's in that category. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, so these are just the books I read last mm. year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, 
Our, we are living in very difficult days. I think every day is difficult because the evil one is around and, uh, and though God will be victorious, they're hard days mm -hmm. and the world is changing so quickly. And so here's some of the books that I found helpful over the mm. last 12 months. This one's a fairly new one. It looks terribly <laughs> is, daunting, yeah. doesn't it? And the title, Biblical Critical Theory. Uh, by Christopher Watkin, mm -hmm. um, an Australian, but he's got a, a background in the arts. Mm. Um, what he does is he deals with the philosophers uh, that stand behind a whole lot of the way that people think these days. Um, and what we and I think I have done in the past is read the philosophers and say, oh, they're wrong because of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, what Watkins does is, is it's critical theory. That is, there are people who criticise the way you understand reality and in lots of the critiques, even of the atheistic and anti-Christian philosophers, there's truth. And so Watkins does, what he does is he explains their position and in a beautiful way, understanding the whole flow of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation shows where they're right and where they're wrong and where there is a better mm. way of putting it together. And so I've loved this book. It actually helps you to understand how to hold the Bible together. Mm -hmm. It helps you to understand the philosophers. And it gives you a way, rather than having an either or, of embracing what is right about philosophy and showing how the scriptures are so much more vibrant mm. and a better alternative. Mm. I think it's um, a super important book. Uh, I'm, I'm on my second journey through this well, at the moment. Very better than me. I've <laughs> well, skimmed it. Well... <laughs> I didn't think it all went in the first uh, the first time, and so I'm just working through it carefully, a chapter a day at the moment. Um, uh, actually, I loved when we got to um, uh, to chapter 12, and um, there was less philosophy in that chapter than in the earlier yeah. ones. And so I thought, oh, I know where I stand yeah. on this one, but I didn't have to work quite yeah, as yeah, hard as in the yeah, earlier yeah. 11 chapters. There's a beautiful image of grace that um, he, he talks about an N-shaped and a U-shaped paradigm. I saw grace in creation mm. in a way that I don't mm. think I'd reflected before. Um, and I do think the effect it's having on me is I am feeling more confident about dealing with the various philosophical yeah. strands. I, that's that's yeah. been the effect. It's yeah. boosted my confidence. Yeah. And, yeah. and you, I mean, you read a bit, but do you think it's the sort of book that pastors can pick up at this oh, absolutely it absolutely. looks intimidating I mean, but it's not you've got to do the work um, mm. and I've had to do the work and there are there are actually there are some bits that I don't understand as well as uh, mm. as others um, uh, but I felt like for me I mean I've, I've said this in other place but um, when I came out of college I've been well equipped to minister to moderns and I had no real idea about how to minister to postmoderns and it was Carson's the gagging of God mm that helped me to work out how to minister to postmoderns. And I think this is going to be almost or as significant book as um, Carson's The Gagging of God mm -hmm. in terms of equipping us for this current next generation. Yeah. And, and I've found that there are some passages like I won't preach on Genesis 3 again without going and reading his chapter. It's a good um, chapter, isn't it? It's yeah. a great chapter. I wonder if it's the sort of book that would be well served to read with other Christian people, other pastors, other yeah, members I'm, of your congregation. I was thinking about that um, uh, because there definitely are areas that I thought, oh, what does this mean? And I want to talk to and I, mm. somebody and I want to help process this. And, and I thought, will I put this on the agenda for our, our staff training for the year? And I'm I'm going back and forth yeah. on that. that I mean, this, there are so many more kind of, if you like, week by week pressing topics. Yeah. We and a book on with. the cross might be better. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> but for me, this has been great. Yeah. 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 It's just, as I say, it's, you need to find something each year that helps you to think through the world. Mm -hmm. as it, I, I know our time's uh, yeah. passing by. I, I've mentioned this one to you before here in The Pastor's Heart, Niall Ferguson's The Square and the Tower. And again, it helps us to understand what's going on in the world. The, the model is... Uh, the, the tower is hierarchies and the squares are networks. Mm -hmm. And we live in a world that is both hierarchical and network. Mm -hmm. And what he does is explain that how they interact. And so in our churches, whatever denomination you are, we have hierarchies, but lots of the activity occurs in networks. So that, that's, that's helpful. It's mm. a, he's, a, he's a historian and so you keep getting 3,000 years of history. So it's hard work, mm. but it, it's very interesting. Is it a Christian book? Uh, no, he, I, I don't know if he's a Christian or not. So, right, yeah. there's, there's a so it's a history book. Yeah, it's really. a history book, yeah. yeah. But the, you know, he deals with, for example, how did the Reformation reach across Europe mm -hmm. in, a, in a decade? Yeah. So well, I that know. sounds fun. Yeah, yeah. It is, yeah. So, <laughs> and, it, and it's in two or three pages. That's what makes it both easy and hard. Yep. Um, 
Again, we live in a world where sexual identity is such a big issue. And for those listening, it's Mere Sexuality by Todd Wilson, re Rediscovering the Christian Vision of yes. Sexuality. Yeah, there's a whole lot of good books out at the moment. Uh, I just picked that one because it's really readable and it, it doesn't try to answer the question about transsexuality and homosexuality, but what did God create sexuality for? Mm -hmm. And then it, from that bigger picture, it moves into it and it does it very graciously and generously too. Right. Mm. Why did God give us the gift of sexuality? Yeah. Yeah. He's dedicated it to Wesley Hill. Mm. Um, yeah, that's... Yeah. Um, there's friendship, celibacy and same-sex relationships in there. What is sex for? One mm. flesh, mm. the image of God and bent sexuality. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really very, and, very and It probably is the case, actually, just like I said, I'd try to read a book on the cross each year. I think we need to be reading a book on sexuality we each do. year. We yeah. do. Yeah. yeah. And that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, I won't spend any time. This, this is the rise and triumph of the modern self. It's an old one, but... <laughs> that was one of my failures this last year. I, I set out with the goal of reading that book and everybody else I know has read it and I never got this is to the it. <laughs> this is the popular version of his work. But it, what it does, it just keeps saying the whole... Our, I bought it, which is yeah. almost as good. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you bought it, you've read it. Um, the, uh, one of the, uh, the things uh, is that in our world these days, it's who I am, my identity, my authenticity. And he gives us the roots of that, where it came from, where we are now, and what's likely to happen as a result of it. Mm -hmm. But that's the sort of thing you'd have a discussion. Can I move on to it? Yeah, the, th the third group of books is, as pastors, we are shepherds of the flock. We are shepherds by knowing God, by amending our lives to conform to what he demands of us, but also of leading the flock to green pastures and making sure the wolves don't come in. So there's a whole lot of books I try to read mm -hmm. uh, each year that just uh, uh, build up my skills. And so here's some of the weird ones. Mm -hmm. This one's uh, the definitive book of body language. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely not Christian, mm -hmm. but the way people will perceive you and whether or not they will listen to what you've got to say is tied up as much in your body language as in the words that you, you say. So the nodding of the head, how you use your thumbs, the place of smiling, all those sorts of things are what people uh, pay attention to. And so that's worth having a read. What did you learn? <laughs> uh, um, I can't remember, <laughs> uh, but uh, the, I think I've just taken it on board. It helps me to read other people. So, you know, if people come into you like this, Mm. Uh, or if you go to a group like that, it says, keep away from me. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, as I said, just how you use your thumbs, we don't even know what we are doing, but people read it all mm. the time. Uh, the Americans, because they do research into this, they say about 80% of your communications, your body language. Mm. Alan and Barbara Peace, yes, The yeah. Definitive Book of Body Language. And, and Next. Again, decisive. Um, it's written by Chip and Dan Heath with a name like Chip, you know, it's got to be American. American uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we think we make our decisions based on rationality and we don't. And so what they do is they just uncover how we make our decisions and give us some tips about how to make them. It's, it actually doesn't uh, pay any attention to God's revelation in Scripture, so it's not sufficient. It's not a book on Christian guidance. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it's, it's not sufficient, but it's actually helpful. Mm, okay. Uh, widen your options, reality test your assumptions, attain distance before deciding. And prepare to be wrong. Yeah, so they use this thing called RAP, which are those four categories. Right, all right. Mm. Complementarian, oh, yeah, this new this one, is, Graham I, I think, and yes, Jane I think Tua. this is probably the must-read book that I had from 2022. Right. And, I, and I think it's actually, it's important because of the word embracing. Mm -hmm. um, I meet so many clergy uh, who say, I don't know what to think about complementarianism or how to That's do appalling. it. You it is appalling. What to... um, we, are, we are meant to shepherd and lead God's people and you, you can never use that as an excuse. And I think that Graham and, uh, and Jane do it wonderfully. They explain what complementarianism is and what it might look like so that we might be able to embrace it. And I think it is a terrible uh, indictment on us that we don't think about it. So those who call ourselves complementarian often don't know how to execute it. And others of us don't know whether we're egalitarian or complementarian because it seems too divisive and too difficult. We've got to, got to come to grips with it. Mm. Um, my reflection on this one, this is the second one that I've read of your big list. <laughs> <laughs> um, my reflection on this one was that um, uh, it's good that we've got it. Um, and in fact, it's a long time since Claire Smith wrote um, Claire Smith wrote that excellent yeah. book, um, 
uh, where she took us through all the gender passages mm. in the New Testament. But that's 20 years ago. Yeah. And there's a lot that's moved in this debate yeah. in the last 20 years. And so we actually need a new book, a yeah. new version of that book. This isn't the same book. Um, this is more of an, an overview. Yeah. Um, where I thought it was disappointing, um, I thought it was a little bit too apologetic. I thought they could have said, here is God's beautiful plan mm. a little bit more strongly. Uh, and I, I was a bit surprised that there wasn't a, a really good treatment on Ephesians 5 in there. Um, but I think you, th th it's, there's a gap in this market, and this is the best book out yeah. in, in I, 20 I think it's, years. It's different to what Claire was trying to do. It's a different do. book. Yeah. It's a so, different book. So I, I but in, just in terms yeah. of painting positively Christian marriage, it, yeah. it, I, I would have liked to have seen that yeah. in there. It, although yeah. it does pick up the trend lines that are going on. So you've talked about the 20 years, you know, and like identity, uh, complementarianism and uh, egalitarianism has moved it moves every year. Yep. And I think they've picked up really well, the trend, up well the trend lines. Yep. Um, these three, I only, I only want to speak about one. Uh, now, they they come as a series. Are... Yes, this one, uh, I should put them in order. Uh, Faith Formation in the Secular Age, which is about yep. youth ministry. Andrew Root is the author and mm -hmm. he's, his background is in youth ministry. The second one was the pastor in the secular age. And the third one is the congregation in the secular age. The third one's uh, the one that I, I've read read well and the others I've just scanned through. Mm -hmm. uh, what it does, I don't agree with everything, but it, what it does is challenge us. It says that uh, we live based on the way Silicon Valley tells us to live, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is true. So uh, for us these days, life is getting busier and busier. And so the clock is determined by how much reach I can have, how much impact I can have. That's the language of Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And everything is in the future. So things aren't enjoyed in the here and now because life is accelerating so much. Uh, it's always future focused. And so the way we make our decisions about how well we've succeeded is in this. And I started reading it because uh, I got interested in, qui in quiet quitting, mm -hmm. uh, that people still are in the workforce but are not working as hard. Mm. And I also have coming out of COVID, churches just said we're too exhausted to do new things. Mm. And he picks up that, that idea and he says, that exhaustion is because we live on Silicon Valley time. And he says, we've got the option of sacred time as well, which is the way that society and the church has operated over the years, the church calendar. Mm -hmm. you know, and just enjoy the fact that our Lord was incarnate at Christmas and the way that he surrendered his life that, as a substitution for us at Easter. And, you know, just the whole church calendar. And we just, we can sit and revel in that. But you can't do that based on Silicon Valley time because my phone keeps going off. Mm. And, it, and it says, you've got to do the next thing. And I've got to have more impact on people. I've got to have more likes. And, the, and so it tells us how to live. And so what he does is he, I think he's pretty good at diagnosing what's going on now. I think uh, I'd want to nuance some of his solutions. Although one of the solutions I like that he says is you can't just go back and do sacred time because we are, our clocks now are yeah. silicon. If valid. I go back and do yeah. that, then everyone else will get their time yeah, yeah, the, the, by the, something the, else. Right. <laughs> it's, it's the end of the past, it's hard. It's yeah. the end of, all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, but I, as I say, it's not these books I'm particularly recommending. I'm just saying a set of books that help us to understand the world in which we are and how to function in it mm. is is something that I think our pastors, we all need to keep working on because we have to lead our flock. Mm, super stimulating. Thanks for coming in. You oh, it's been great. Thank, thank you. And as I say, I don't want people to be intimidated by having to read all these. Pick a couple of things. Mm -hmm. and I think the three areas are the word of God, understanding the world that we are in and how to be a good practitioner uh, of the Lord's work in the world that we find ourselves in. Thanks for that. My guest on The Pastor's Heart, the very well-read Archie Poulos. Uh, he lectures at Sydney's Moore Theological College, and we will look forward to your company next Tuesday afternoon on The Pastor's Heart.